this chapter kind of becomes like a broken record because we just end up doing the same steps over and over again. It's just we're changing the parameter that's involved. So you know, we did a mean, and if we knew sigma, we'd look for z-scores. If we don't know sigma, we'd look for t-scores. And now we're going to do proportion, and then later we will do uh, variance or standard deviation. <coughs> But otherwise, you're going to see the exact same steps that we've been doing over and over again. There are just some small changes depending on what parameter proportion that we're looking at. So, there are two common methods for testing a claim about a population proportion. You can use a normal distribution as an approximation to the binomial distribution, which is uh, the same kind of thing that we've been doing using those z-scores. Or we can use an exact method based on the binomial probability distribution. The requirements for a normal distribution. The sample observations are a simple random sample. The conditions for a binomial distribution are you have to have a fixed number of trials, two outcomes, and constant probabilities. The conditions are NP is greater than or equal to 5, or NQ is greater than or equal to 5. So the binomial distribution can be approximated by a normal distribution with mean equaling NP and sigma equaling the square root of NPQ. Now remember that P plus Q has to equal 1. So if you know 1, you automatically know the other. <coughs> Alright, so being that now we're doing proportion, it's a different equation for our test statistic. Uh, this is the z-score uh, calculation, p hat. That is the uh, proportion from our sample, minus p, probability of success, divided by p times q over n, and then square root it. Don't forget about the square root there in the denominator. <coughs> the one nice thing about proportion as opposed to mean is mean could be Z scores if you know sigma or T scores if you don't know sigma. Proportion is always looking at Z scores. Alright, so we're going to jump back to the p-value method here. Again, all the same steps. Symbolic form of the claim. Symbolic form, the claim is false. H1 is the claim does not contain the equal sign. And H0 is the claim that does contain the equal sign and as I mentioned in your homework my math lab and in the book very often instead of using the equal sign they will use either less than or equal to or greater than or equal to about the only time they use equal to is when the claim is actually a not equal to select alpha based on the seriousness of the type 1 error and generally again they're going to give you the alpha in the the homework problems uh, 0.05 and 0.01 are the most common. Identify the relevant statistic and determine the sampling distribution, which in this case means the normal distribution, table 4. Find the test statistic and p-value. In this case, the p-value comes from the test statistic. Then we reject the null hypothesis, H0, if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, which means that the area of that p-value is more extreme than alpha or we fail to reject H0 if the p-value is greater than alpha, so it actually extends closer to the center than alpha does. And then we restate the results in simple terms and address the original claim. If we're doing the traditional method, again, steps 1 through 5 are the same as the p-value method. The big difference is, you know, after we find the test statistic, we're then going to go find the critical values in the critical region based on alpha. And then we're going to compare the test statistic to the critical region. So really the way to look at it is in the p-value method, we're comparing areas. In the traditional method, we are comparing the z-scores that bound those areas. has to be the same result, but just slightly different ways of visualizing the problem. And then of course if we're doing the confidence interval method for a two-tailed hypothesis construct a confidence interval with 1 minus alpha we know it's two-tailed if the claim is a not equal to. And then for a one-tailed hypothesis test so the claim is either greater than or less than 
we construct a confidence interval of 1 minus 2 alpha. We reject the claim if the population parameter is not included in the confidence interval. Now, <coughs> all of those things were for doing uh, very similar to what we've done before. If, however, we want to use what's called the exact method for testing claims about a population proportion, we use the p-value method with a binomial probability distribution and not the normal distribution. So that's really the big difference. Our p-value is going to come from a binomial probability distribution, and we'll look at an example of that shortly. The p is assumed in the null hypothesis in a left-tailed test. The p-value is the probability of getting x or fewer successes in n trials. In a right-tailed test, the p-value is the probability of getting x or fewer successes in, in trials. And then in a two-tailed test, it's twice the probability of getting x or more successes if p is greater than p or getting x or fewer successes if p hat is less than p. So really, that's the difference. If it's, if it's left-tailed or right-tailed, it's basically the same thing. But if it's two-tailed, we're going to have to go with twice. So similar to what we did before, we're going to look at one basic situation and then see how it looks in the various approaches. So here we have 726 babies born to couples using the XSORT method. 668 of the babies were girls out of the 726, and the rest were boys. We want to use the 0.05 significance level, so that's our alpha. To test the claim that couples using the XSORT method had a proportion of girls greater than the value of 0.5 that is expected with no treatment. Remember that the null hypothesis is basically it doesn't work. It makes no difference. And so this method, whatever it is, it's not important to uh, our story right here, doesn't work, then boys versus girls should just be 50-50. So are the minimum requirements met? We do have subjects that are self-selected because, honestly, we're talking about the people who want babies, but uh, that should not necessarily bias the results since they don't really have any control over that. We do have a fixed number of trials, 726, and so when you do NP and NQ, and again, since P is 0.5, 50-50 chance, uh, 726 times 0.5 is 363, whether you're doing NP or NQ. All right, let's look at the p-value method first. And again, these really are the same steps that we've been looking at over and over again. Okay, It's just that now we have a slightly different equation to use because we're looking at a sample proportion. So, and this is also something that you should be aware of. We're doing proportion, so that means our claim is with p. When we were doing mean, our claim was with mu. When we go to standard deviation or variance, then our claim will be with sigma or sigma squared. So this is part of what is it we're testing. So p is greater than 0.5 is our claim, our counterclaim, or that the claim is false as p is less than or equal to 0.5. So the one that gets the equal sign is the null hypothesis. This is back to our claim, so these two should match. Alpha is 0.05, our p hat, and now sometimes they'll just give you the p hat. In other words, they'll give you the decimal. But sometimes you'll actually have to calculate the p hat. This is the sample proportion. There were 668 girls out of the 726 babies. And again, we're going to use table 4 in the normal distribution. We go ahead and plug these things into our formula. And again, the 0.5 comes from... That's what we expect for the null hypothesis, that the stuff doesn't work, and so it's just 50-50 like it would always be. And then the 0.92, that comes from our sample. So 0.92, subtract the 0.5, all divided by 0 0.5 times 0.5 over 726, and we get 22.63. Notice what a gigantic z-score that is, okay? After all, 99% of all the data should fit within 3.5 z-scores. This is out at 22 over 22 z-scores from the mean. 22 standard deviations away from the mean. Now, the p-value is the area to the right 
of that z-score. And if we're using table 4, well, table 4 only goes up to 3.5, so that would be 0.9999, which means the p-value, 1 minus that, would be 0 0.0001. It's actually a lot less than that, but we will just use the very last value, basically, 1 subtract 0.9999. Remember, the table always goes to the left. This is to the right because we have a greater than. So 1 minus that gives us the 0 0.001. Well, hey, that is much smaller than 0 0.05, so we reject the null hypothesis. So in a previous example, we had to fail to reject because the p-value was greater than. This time it's less than, a lot less than, and so we reject the null hypothesis. And then we say there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the method works because it does have results a lot better than 50-50. So that would be the p-value method. Now let's look at the traditional method. And again, in the traditional method, the first five steps are virtually the same. They're just laying out what information is in the problem. What's the claim? What's the counterclaim? What's the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis? What table are you going to use? Find the test statistic. Again, the test statistic, for this case, proportion, p hat minus p over the square root of pq over n. So all of that's the same from before. The difference is, now that we've done this, instead of turning that into a p-value, we're going to take our alpha and turn it into a critical value. And so 1 minus that, because remember, we're to the right, since it's a greater than case. Table is always to the left, so we have to subtract from 1. So 1 minus 0 0.05 is 0 0.95. That's the area to the left. That gives us a critical value of 1.645. So here, we're comparing z-scores. Up here, we were comparing areas. But these areas go with the two z-scores. Z They're the bound of that area. So, since 22.63 is a lot bigger than 1.645, meaning it's way beyond, it's much more extreme, we reject the null hypothesis that h naught is simply 0.5, that the proportion of having a boy or girl is 50-50 with this method, and then there is sufficient evidence to support the claim the XSORT method works. And a little note here, the difference between the p-value method and the traditional critical values method is that the p-value method compares the areas beyond the z-scores, while the traditional method compares the z-scores that bound those areas. All right, so we've had p-value and traditional. Now let's look at confidence interval. Again, the first five steps are just setting up the problem. They're not really different. What is different is step six. Step six, we're going to build the confidence interval. And again, you know, a lot of it's the same stuff because it comes from the same information. It's still, that's our claim. P is greater than 0.5. It's a right-tailed test, which leads us to that same z-score we had just a moment ago for our critical z-score, 1.645. However, now we're going to use that z-score to calculate the margin of error. So E equals z-score, uh, critical z-score times the screw to p-hat, q-hat. How do you get p-hat and q-hat? Notice that they add to 1. This, the 0.92, that came from the 668 over 726. This comes from 1 minus the 0.92. So p-hat, q-hat divided by the total n of the sample square root, don't forget the square root, and we get our 0 0.0166. Now we've got to build our confidence interval as p hat subtract the margin of error, p hat plus the margin of error. Go ahead and plug your numbers in, and here is our confidence interval. So it goes from 0 0.904 up to 0.937. And guess what? 0.5 isn't in there anywhere. 0.5 is below the entire interval. And since it's not in the interval, it's below the entire interval. And it's not barely below. It's way below the entire interval. 
we reject the null hypothesis and we say there is sufficient evidence to support the claim the XORT method works. And again, note the results should be the same regardless of what the method is, regardless of whether we were doing the p-value, the traditional, or the confidence interval method. All right, so now let's look at a second example. We have a study of 57 out of 104 pregnant women who correctly guessed the sex of their babies. Use these sample data to test the claim that the success rate of such guesses is no different from 50-50. So just because this is a little bit higher than halfway, halfway would be 52, no, they're just lucky, okay? This is just random chance. It happens that this sample of 104 women came out a little bit above 50-50. That's what the claim is. Okay, we're going to use the 0.05 significance level. Are the minimum requirements met? We can treat this as a simple random sample. There are a fixed number of trials, 104. And so again, with P and Q both equaling 0 0.5, 104 times 0 0.5 is 52. So we're fine on that score. All right, let's look at the p-value method again. Same steps as before, but in this case, since the claim the claim is that P is only 0.5. Okay, and, and again, the null hypothesis has to go with the equal sign, which means in this case, the alternative hypothesis, the H1, has to be not equal to. And so our P hat came from the 57 over 104 equals the 0 0.548. 0 0.548 subtract the 0.5 divided by the square root of 0.5 times 0.5 divided by 104. Again, the 0.5 comes from 50-50 is what you'd expect if they had no ability to guess correctly. Now, this one is a two-tailed test. We know it's two-tailed because this is P is not equal to 0.5. The p-value is it's the area to the right of z equals 0.98 and to the left of z equals negative 0.98. So this will always set up a plus or minus case for our critical areas when you have the not equal to one to the right, one to the left. They'll be the same number, but one will be positive and one will be negative. So a z-score of 0.98 gives us an area of 0.8365 to the left. But if we're concerned about the greater than case, we need to subtract from 1, so 1 subtract 0.8365 gives us 0.1635. And then here's the big deal. Since this is a two-tailed test, we have to double that area, and that's our p-value. So 1.635 doubled gives us 0.327. So all of that, okay, from here down to here, so all of that, that's my step 6. That's, all, that's where most of the stuff is going on. Uh, and in fact, that's why in a lot of the questions in the book or in the My Math Lab, they just give you some of those things to see if you can do the, the fail to reject or the reject part uh, and don't have to go through all that work on the questions. So since the p-value equals 0.3 is a heck of a lot better than 0.05, and again, p-value always compares with alpha, since it's much bigger, that means that the area of the p-value extends closer to the middle than alpha did. Alpha was more extreme. We failed to reject the null hypothesis that p is just 0.5. And so we say there is insufficient evidence to reject the claim that it's simply guessing. We can't say that it isn't just guessing, that it isn't just random chance. All right, so in comparison, if we're doing the traditional method instead of the p-value method, again, the first five steps are all the same. Uh, only this time, we're going to take our alpha, which was 0.05, but that means since it's two-tailed, that it's 0.025 in each tail. And then when we turn that into what z-score it is, so we could look up 0 0.025, which would be on the left side, and that would give us the negative 1.96. Or we could subtract 1, 
which would give us 0.975, 975, 0.975, and that would give us the positive one. So we will have our plus or minus there. So, you know, what you have to envision is if you got the normal distribution, you know, and you've got negative 1.96 out here, and you got positive 1.96 over there, so it's kind of like this. Well, where does 0.98 fall? Well, it's actually about halfway between these critical values and the mean of zero. So these are not within the critical region. In other words, they're not bigger than the 1.96. They are not out in the extreme portions of the tails. And so we, re we fail to reject H0. Again, the closer you are to the middle, the more likely we expect it is to happen. Inferential statistics is all about if we don't expect it to happen, if it's really rare, then we can suggest that the claim is not true. And we don't really prove it's not true. We just say we fail to have evidence that it's true. If we do the confidence interval, again, we're going to uh, find our margin of error. It's the same z-score we were looking at the critical z-score a moment ago. Uh, the 0.548, that's the same, 57 over 104. The 0.452 comes from 1 subtract the 0.548. Divide by 104, we get 0 0.0956, almost 0 0.1. p-hat subtract e, p-hat plus e. And so, note, the confidence interval says RP should be between 0.452 and 0.644. And in this case, 0.5 is in there. So we cannot reject the null hypothesis that says P equals 0.5, because 0.5 is definitely above 0.45 and below 0.64. So the confidence interval could contain our null hypothesis. And so we say there is insufficient evidence to reject the claim that it's simply guessing 50-50. And then we didn't do this last time, but this time we're going to use the exact method. Okay, And uh, in terms of our requirement checks, if we go back to the beginning, we still have um, the subjects are self-selected, but probably shouldn't have any bias since they have no control over getting boys or girls. It does have a fixed number of trials. However, in case number three is not needed, number three was the, the NP is greater than five or the NQ is greater than five. We don't care about that in this case because we're going to actually use an exact binomial distribution instead of an approximation using the normal distribution. So what we want to look at is what's the probability of having 57 or more girls. And so here's our formula. Okay, please note this one is always going to be NC and then whatever our X is. In this case, the X is the 57. And then this exponent will also match that one all the time, so 0.5 to the 57. And then this one comes from 1 subtract that exponent. So 1 subtract 57, that gives us the 47. And then since our P is about 0.5, so these are both 0.5. If this, on the other hand, was 0.6, then this one, on the other hand, would be 0.4, because they have to add up to be 1. So multiply all that stuff together, we get 0.1888. This is a two-tailed test, and P hat equals 0.548, which is greater than 0.5. So we have to double this 0.1888, and when we double it, we get 0.3776. And again, we're doing p-value with this exact uh, binomial answer. p-value of 0.3776 is greater than alpha 0.05, so that's a lot bigger than that one. We fail to reject the null hypothesis, because what that means is that the, uh, you know, if I get a little scratch piece of paper, you know, what that means is if you consider a normal distribution, you know, my alpha 
was like this. But my p-value is like that. It's extending way in from the extreme compared to the alpha that was just out here. And so because of that, we have to fail to reject the null hypothesis. And so that is section on doing uh, hypothesis testing with proportion. Next time we'll do hypothesis testing with variance and standard deviation.